Let's dive in here. So why this topic? Um, for me, I've been, in the past five years, I've been teaching at Lee University in Cleveland, Tennessee. I recently, just this summer, actually had a career trajectory change back into ministry full time. I'm at a church where I used to serve doing student choirs. Now I'm back at Hunter Street Baptist in Birmingham, Alabama as the worship pastor there. Um, so I'm getting back into this and getting my hands back on the student choir. Uh, one that I used to work with uh, nine years ago was when I left. In this past five, six years, I've heard different things anecdotally. I'm very involved in ACDA. I hear of programs, not just student choir programs, but entire choral programs and churches that are struggling, that are dwindling for a whole host of reasons. Um, and folks are discouraged by this, understandably, and wanting to know what's going on. And then. We see things in our culture that seem to be kind of very um, the antithesis to kind of what it means to maybe be in a choir, everything that a choir experience stands for. I would work with students that were incredibly talented, uh, going to be great worship leaders. They were singing in choirs, but the thought of them leaving, having a degree in music and worship, <laughs> and actually maybe starting a choir did not cross their minds. They had been enjoying the bounty of being in choirs, the experience that provided, but the very thought of saying it was worth doing, it was worth doing so much that I would create something if I went to a church that didn't have one, never was not in their mind. And I thought that was strange. I thought, how could you have been in this for so long but yet not see the need for the skills that would enable you to add something of this impact into your ministry that you'd be leading one day. So I'm thinking, what's what's at play here that's kind of, is it, what, what's the, some factors or culturally that's, where's the some sort of disconnect that's weird to me that I keep hearing about? Um, and it's, so it's, it's a pressing topic. I think uh, as I hear things in the ACDA, as I hear things in talking with church musicians, church musicians and worship pastors, on the other side, I hear of places where choirs are flourishing. They're just booming. It's uh, So I don't want to say it's a broad stroke, uh, broad brush stroke that, that choirs are dying, but there is a lot that's been written that says in a lot of pockets, it is more at risk, if we want to use that kind of language, than it ever has been before in many churches, especially evangelical churches. Um, and so, yeah, that was some personal observations of things I've seen. Here's some recent articles that I came across, things online, so we're going to fill in some blanks here. So this one, Why Are Church Choirs on the Decline? I've given the, um, the, the reference there for you. This is from Jim Sweeney. This was written in December of last year, and he reports that a 2014 national congregation study found that fewer white Protestant churches of all denominations have choirs though they continue to be prevalent in black Protestant congregations and Catholic churches. Conservative white evangelical churches, 40% have a choir. That's down from 63% 14 years ago. Moderate liberal Protestant congregations, 50% had a choir in 2012, which is down from 78% in 1998. Very interesting uh, statistics coming from that. A couple other points that the article talks about. Various reasons for decline. Here we go. Money and time. The time to get to practice and the, the time to perform. It, as we know, good choirs aren't easy to have. They're really a choir at all. It takes time. It takes hard work. Lack of participation. Interest. Lack of leadership. No one's there with the skills to know how to do this. Um, then there has also been this desire to, to connect with younger audiences, and the, the thought is somehow that a choir can't do that, or that other mediums have a better ability at doing of, of doing that. Uh, and this last one here, this is really interesting: a big increase in small or satellite churches. The kind of uh, this is somewhat negative, but the franchise church mentality, multiple campuses. Uh, when a congregation is getting off the ground they have many more goals than assembling a choir, right? So that, that's understandable. Mm -hmm. Even if the desire is there, they, the congregation is going to feel like they have to wait until they have a decent a, a core of people enough to maybe even try something like this. 
in the article, the response that's, that is reported is this kind of response of defending choirs. Uh, this idea that choirs and choir music are superior to contemporary music, right? Uh, and there are some sort of higher form of worship. You've heard these arguments, and maybe you've even made them yourself. Uh, the, the idea that a choir, which is true, is a way for more congregants to get involved in the church. And I think that is certainly true, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, and then this idea in defending a choir, as the article represent, uh, references, that choirs also ev or evoke or remind us of this heavenly chorus of singing and, 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 and angels and the choirs that are even referenced in the Bible. Another article, a little older, but still has this topic, why, uh, Many Church Choirs Are Dying, Here's Why, from 2014. This article points out a few things. Many people don't like to perform. In this American Idol, the voice culture, the sense of if I can't do that, I shouldn't be doing anything at all, right? And that's negatively impacted some musical uh, ensemble making. Uh, in this article, I'll give you a little background first. Mary Prius, choir director at uh, Saviors Lutheran Church in Minneapolis, blames our culture of performance and expertise. We don't sing anywhere else in our lives the way we once did. I grew up singing at home, in school, and church every week. Now, as I was just mentioning, now people think they are not good enough to sing. This other thing, number two, the article talks about that people are moving. You've probably seen this in your own congregations. Here's a, a story from the article. Alan Purdom, minister of music at Howland Community Church in Ohio, said, Our choir survives because some of my friends and wife are in it. Um, and he mentions that on Sunday mornings, 8 to 12 people and a hired soprano sing for about 80 people in services, where 40 years ago, a choir of 30 voices sang to hundreds of the pews. This is an interesting point that the article makes. I hadn't thought about this. The recession was a real big hit to many churches. Music in, that, in areas would be cut. Giving is down. The resources to have that kind of program. Budgets are tight. You've seen or heard of this in schools or colleges or community programs. I thought this was interesting. The article said that sales for music for choral anthems slipped so deeply four years ago that the United Methodist Church's publishing arm, Abington Press, stopped buying new anthem music, said Mary Catherine Dean, associate publisher. And then 13 years ago, when Joey Lott, the article talks about, became director of worship arts for Maples uh, Memorial Methodist Church in Olive Branch, Mississippi, there were 55 in the choir. In 2008, when the recession hit, I lost, he says, 15 members of my choir in six months. They had to move elsewhere for work. They started the, that started the descent. From there, he's now down to 25 people, Lot said. Very interesting. Well, and hopefully those persons found a new choir a someplace A new choir, else. exactly. Or, unfortunately, some of them ended up having to work on Sundays. Yes, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. So it, it definitely impacted people moving and doing different things. This article says the response is to suggest adapting choirs. How can we do that? Consider use and function. This is interesting. Prius, who was with the Lutheran Church I mentioned ago, Prius spent decades working to revive the joy of singing. She does it with creative choices for music and staging. Choir members don't stand or sit in a special spot. They don't wear special clothes or robes. They just stand up where they are in the pews and sing. How interesting is that? Mm -hmm. Repertoire choices. Mm -hmm. And because traditional church music is challenging, the article says, even for the most talented singers, Mary Prius, we just mentioned ago, takes time to hunt down more accessible music. This might be things that are taught by rote. This might even be things that are more folk-based, maybe even from Africa or even Latin American music. Interesting. This tension, performance versus worship. The idea of a performance choir fading away and the increase of more of a worship-leading choir. Charles Billingsley, who was, uh, has been the worship pastor at Thomas Road Baptist in Lynchburg, uh, Virginia, talks about this. Um, he mentions also that in the age of church planning, there's a lot of startups. Even some of these churches will throw up risers and have maybe 20 or 30 people sing. An interesting but different anecdotal take on the idea of the small satellite churches. He's seen it where they do throw up the risers and try to make the choirs happen. Um, anyway, so just a few interesting articles I, I kind of stumbled on that, that kind of speak to this issue and maybe some things to consider moving <laughs> forward. 
Think now of the broader culture as it relates to choir and uh, culture. And I, I guess we're going to get into thinking about students in a minute, but I'm trying to paint a little broader picture about the choral experience. There's a lot of tensions in our society right now. I think in many churches there's generational tensions. Where I just came from, this idea of being a part of the young, hip, cool church for the 20-somethings. I have even seen that on a bulletin board outside the church. We are the church for the 20-somethings. And then there's the church that says we're not going to be that. We're the church for senior adults who've been in church their whole, you know, it's like, so we get, we're getting in places I see and hear of this, this tension between ages. Now, we hear a lot more about number two, racial tensions. Everybody's, you know, this all idea of, of racial diversity in churches. I want to go back and say, what about diversity of age? Why are we not as equally concerned about that in our congregations? We should be equally concerned about this, okay? And then there's socioeconomic status tensions. ACDA's even taken an approach of how do they adjust their honor choir events that can easily become kind of elitist because you can't pay to go take your kids to an honor choir, so only the kids that can't pay get to enjoy the experience. So we have to be very careful that the arts don't become music, whether it's in the church or school. There's a tension there. If we have the money to make it, great. Then if we don't, well, too bad, so sad, you just don't have the experience. Well, that's not, that's kind of hard to think about, right? There's, there's just some tensions in the broader culture. The other half of that, though, is on the lower end, they don't have the money to go and have all the voice lessons that the other ones do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those yeah. are the ones who are... Mm -hmm. Well, that's not the other end. That's the same thing. That's the same thing. Like, if you don't have the money to enjoy or experience the arts, there's a domino effect, and, and that starts to play out in different places. We see it in churches and schools. Let's drill down a little bit deeper now into student culture. There's a great article here. I'm not going to unpack it, but I want to draw it to your attention because you should really go spend time and read it. It's from the Pew uh, Research Center. Teen Social Media and Technology, 2018. Brand spanking new. It came out uh, May 31st. Okay? Huge study on teens and uh, social media use. Again, more to unpack there than we can do in a session, but go spend some time. The one I want to focus on here is this one. Eight differences between millennials and Generation Z. Now, sometimes we're incorrectly lumping our students in this millennial category. If they're in youth car right now, they're not a millennial. Mm -hmm. They're what would be considered Generation Z. Let's clarify. I'm in the millennial category barely. I'm born in 1981. It bothers me because I hate being lumped in with millennials. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but anyway, 1980 to 2000. Generation Z generally is accepted. Anybody born in 2000, some like to say 95, or thereafter. Okay, so think about it. Your current student choirs, if it's grade six to 12, has anyone born between 2000 and 2006? All right, so really they're all going to be in this Generation Z category. Sure, they may have millennial brothers or sisters and they're around that kind of mindset, okay? This article unpacks these eight differences and let's talk about them really quickly. The first one they say is uh, in comparison this idea, the differences between millennials and Gen Z. Gen Z is less focused. Today, relevance is constantly being redefined, and Gen Z lives in a world of continuous updates. Gen Z processes information faster than any other generation, thanks to apps like Snapchat and Vine. Their attention spans are much lower than millennials. Okay, something to think about. But yet, they're better multitaskers. Though Gen Z can be less focused than their millennial counterparts, they will create a document on their school computer, do research on their phone or tablet while taking notes on a notepad, then finish in front of the TV with a laptop while basic timing a friend. You get the idea, right? Mm -hmm. So they're very good at multitasking. Bargains, this is interesting. Millennials care more about prices than Gen Z, the article says. This is arguably because they came of age during this recession we had. 67% of millennials Surveys said that they would go to the website to get a coupon, whereas only 46% of Gen Z polled that they would do the same. Interesting. Gen Z is full of what they describe as early starters. 
Many employers are predicting that more teens between the ages of 16 and 18 will go straight into the workforce, opting out of the traditional route of higher ed and instead finishing school online, if at all. Would you make a major investment, as the article says, possibly leading to years of debt to come, knowing there are new, more affordable, not to mention more convenient, <coughs> online alternatives coming up every day? Gen Z knows the true value of independence, and knowledge is no exception here. Uh, they are capable of learning something themselves, and through a more efficient, non-traditional route, they will take that opportunity. Number five, the article states that Gen Z is more entrepreneurial. According to Gen Z marketing strategist Deep Patel, the newly developing high-tech and highly networked world has resulted in an entire generation thinking and acting more entrepreneurially. Generation Z desires more independent work environments. As a matter of fact, 72% of teens say they want to start a business someday. Number six, Gen Z has higher expectations than millennials. Millennials remember playing solitaire, coming home to dial up internet, yes, and using AOL. Yes, I can affirm that. Generation Z was born into a world overrun with technology. What was taken uh, as amazing, inspiring inventions now is taken as a given for teens, right? Quote, when it doesn't get there that fast, they think something's wrong. End quote, said Marcy Merriman, executive director of growth and strategy at Ernst & Young. Quote, they expect businesses, brands, and retailers to be loyal to them. If they don't feel appreciated, they're going to move on. It's not about them being loyal to the business. End quote. Number seven, Gen Z is big on individuality. Gen Zers were born social. In fact, nearly 92% of Gen Z has a digital footprint. Think about that. Arguably, as a result of the celebrities and media they follow, Gen Z seeks uniqueness in all walks of life, primarily through the brands they do business with, future employers, etc. And last, Gen Z is more global. I like that word. Millennials were considered the first, quote, global generation with the development of the internet. But as more of the world comes online, the article states, Gen Z will become more global in their thinking, interactions, and relatability. 58% of adults worldwide, ages 35 and up, agree that, quote, kids today have more in common with their global peers than they do with adults in their own country. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Diversity will be an expectation of Gen Z. All right, we've had a little bit of short interaction. How does this affirm or deny the observations that you have seen? Anything we have just talked about. The articles, student life, and culture. Let's just reflect, I'm curious. This is what is, I've presented and pulled out and some research has shown. But what has your own personal experience been? Don't jump at once. Well, they're interested in, in, like the kids in my group want solos. They want to be recognized individually. They are in it if it recognizes themselves. Mm -hmm. Not so much for the, it's not so much about a group. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. That's what I've noticed, which kind of goes to your you know, individuality. Mm -hmm. uh, comments? I noticed it's harder to, I mean, I'm, considering now that I'm going to have more kids doing the one day retreat, but it's harder to get them to interact mm. physically. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in, in the olden days, <laughs> you could say to a 12th grader, 11th grader, I need you to mentor this one. And I think they still like that, but it happens that day. And then it's like, it's done. Mm -hmm. it, it's getting it to be consistent. Mm -hmm. um, team building, I guess. Mm -hmm. it's just, it, that's been something I've struggled with, is getting them to yeah. It's that over scheduling in the schedules. Mm -hmm. They're just not available because they have this mm -hmm. or that. The number of things, I guess. Yeah. They really choose to be there. They're there to be there with their friends and then they get hooked mm -hmm. in the music making. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Good. But they interact well, but it's. Mm -hmm. My new group coming up, I think, will. Mm -hmm. They're all of the same age, but. Mm -hmm. Still getting all the ages.
it just intermingled, and that's what I would like more of. Yeah. Other comments, other thoughts. Speaking not just of teenagers, but the choir state. What have you seen or heard? Anyone want to elaborate on that? Friends at either the churches or experiences they've had, not just with the student choir, but even maybe with their adult choir in general, keeping it, or is it, or is it the reverse? Have you seen it thriving? Well, I think it depends upon your your church that you're in. Is your mm -hmm. church thriving? That's what your I'm asking. Church yeah. going down. Yes. And ours right now ours has been going down so my adult choir has gone down people have moved or they've just for for us i think um they have become they're no longer fed from the main from the pulpit when they have service and it's just kind of like and uh, so so that's really hard and we have just, in the last year, we are dinosaurs. <laughs> um, they finally created a contemporary service. Interesting. Okay. And we have a 63-year-old man who's leading it. Okay. But you're not going to have a choir in a contemporary service, and that's basically the reason for much of the fun choirs. Yeah. All around me, we're fairly blended. So most of the churches are contemporary, but no choir at all. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, those term that terminology is so, if I could burn those words from the face of the planet, I think I would. Mm -hmm. Which ones? Contemporary blended and traditional. <laughs> I just I remove them from our language all the time. Because they mean so many different things in so many different places. Mm -hmm. It could mean, you know, blended could mean the yeah, style of the music. It could mean the forces used, choir, or orchestra, or band. And it could mean so many different things. Mm -hmm. right. it's, it's very hard to nail that down. It's like, and yell over the wall. It's very hard. I think, to your point, I have heard, maybe all of you, and I don't want to be Debbie Downer here, okay? I'm hoping to bring you some good news, but we like the gospel. We must need to know the bad news first to know how good the good news is. Mm -hmm. um, is that church -wide, uh, nationwide, church attendance is down. Mm -hmm. Nationwide, across the board. I've heard that, and that there are articles out. I don't have that to reference. I wish I did. Um, all denominations across the board. Yeah. So that's, you're not alone if you're experiencing that. So that's a little glimmer of encouragement uh, for you. There we go. I've put together now a chart, and I've given this to you, and you can see it all there. This is, we're not going to do blank points, but I was thinking, with the topic choir with culture, is are they friends or foes? Here's how I see them being foes. And so it's laid out there for you to see. And I put it up there. Just some reflecting and thinking. Is culture some elements that seem to be really dominant thought uh, mindset in our culture? I've listed on the left. And then how the mindset I think of the choral experience is. And so how you can see them sort of at odds. I think you're right, it's already been mentioned. Our culture is increasingly individualistic, more person-centered, we have a lot of division right now in our, in our culture. There's a question, bigger question is what about me, often. Um, it is a microwave world. The Gen Z article just talked about mm -hmm. quick, fast, right? Immediate gratification, kind of that same idea. People are busy, overcommitted, we've heard this, trying to get people to come and do, just be a part of programming a church. There is very much a consumer mentality. What's in it for me? I want this, I want to consume, 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 and when I've used that up, I'm gonna to go to the next thing. Think about how you do this with music. You all probably are bought into this. If you find a song you like, how often do you repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, listen to it over and over and over and over? And then you need to find something new to listen to, right? It's a part, it's in my lot, it's in my mindset already like that. But what if our choir kind of responds to those issues, I think can respond to those issues. It's much more corporate, it's more communal, more team focused, it's more built on unity. The question that we want to ask in the choral experience is what about us? That whole idea of working together. I call it crock pot cooking. Any musical experience, if it's meaningful, is crock pot work. But we live in a microwave world, friends. And I'll tell you this, this connects into very much the heart of even discipleship. 
that is a real interesting thing, that music can be a little microcosm of a bigger issue that is spiritual growth. True spiritual growth is crockpot work, friends. But if everybody's looking for a short, quick answer and a magic pill, and it just does not work that way, mm -hmm. right? Delayed gratification. We need more experiences of this. Our students don't know how to work in this. So how do you introduce, whether it's taking lessons and helping your kids or encouraging or providing lessons, different things for students, children to have experiences in delayed gratification gradually as they develop, okay? Time commitment, as we know, is gonna be required in the oral experience, yeah? I love this, this hit me, the consumer mentality of our uh, culture, but choir is a creating mentality. If there's, what are you consuming when you're in the choral experience? I mean, you're consuming music, you're making music, but you're producing, you're not just digesting and eat, but you're, you're getting sustenance, you're creating something, yeah? And the question for the choir, I think, in such a worship is not what's in it for us, what's in it for them? or even better, what's in it for him, our audience of one, yeah? That's really, really important. But how can they be friends? Something a more uh, positive note. Here's some things I've just, I was thinking about, I just kind of wrote them down, and I think this is, it's encouraging to me. In our culture, we see a lot of these things. We see a desire for unity. Well, that's great. Choir is a place where you can encourage bonds of togetherness through rehearsing, performing, and serving. Culture, this is desire for peace. You can bring peace into someone's life by having an orderly rehearsal, by the beauty that's in the music you sing, by the acts of service that you engage with with that choir in the community. You can bring peace. This is desire for inclusion. So that means your choir probably needs to have an open door policy and does music that helps unite, breaks down barriers. Maybe it does different cultural types of music that are reflected in your community. There's this desire for quality time. Well, that's, you know, people are saying this, that they don't actually get to spend quality time and they don't know what to do. Well, go spend time rehearsing with your brothers and sisters in, in your church, then performing, then serving together. That's quality time. The breakdown of the family unit. Well, we know choirs can be families for people. Isn't that a great one? Desire to make an impact, champion a cause. This is a really big thing with the millennials, especially those Gen Zers. Man, that's huge. Put them as an army motivated to serve and make an impact. Not just singing on Sunday mornings, but doing things outside of the walls of the church. Suddenly the choir is addressing this issue. The desire for authenticity. People are saying and talking about these things, although they sometimes don't know how to say it, but meaningful relationships. A choir can be a safe place to be yourself and to allow your students, your people, to be vulnerable with one another as they worship together. They, I mean, worship is a very personal thing, but it can also be a very corporate thing. And choir somehow grabs both of those things in a healthy tension that is individual yet corporate at the same time. Then this thing right here. My wife and I were talking about this the other day in our recent move. As we've talked to people and engaging with different members of the congregation and just see them at the grocery store or the doctor's office or something. At the end of the day, people just want to be known. They want to know that you know them. And so there's this desire in our deep places of our hearts that nobody likes to talk about to know. We hate, we hate not knowing. And the desire to be known. And so how can choirs be a place to learn something, learn how to worship, learn about God, learn theology, learn scripture, learn your neighbor's names, and also a place to develop a skill and to build friendships. So when you look at this, it's like, wow, how the possibilities, I think, for choir to intersect the needs of our culture are amazingly positive. I think it addresses so many of the, the breakdowns that we have seen, right? Oh my goodness. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Life Together says this. I love this quote. Let the person who cannot be alone be aware of community. Let the person who is not in community beware of being alone. Isn't that good? The choir as a community. Amazing. 
amazing environment for all sorts of amazing, positive, uh, influential things to happen. What are other ways, maybe you talk for a minute here, that culture influences our choral world and the choral experience, or even the creative arts in general? What have you, anything you've seen that you want to mention? How culture is impacting, whether it's positive or negative, okay? Or you could ask, uh, answer this question. What are some other ways that you think choir, choirs can influence culture? Any takers? Well, the older generation is always so impressed when, you're, when you bring a young choir in and they sing. And, mm -hmm. it, 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 and so it can it can help to cross some of those generation gaps mm -hmm. of understanding. Yeah. Why the need for this community youth choir? Well, getting youth involved, you said a minute ago. Of course. I feel like this, there's some connection here. Yeah, well, where we are in our culture, in Hammond, Louisiana, it's very arts oriented. And so, um, really, it's twofold. The, the churches actually are the one pocket in our community that are not mm. arts oriented. Mm. Um, and so, for me, part of our mission is to engage some of those students uh, with the gospel and with Christ that we otherwise wouldn't be able to get a hold of. Um, we've got some high school choral directors involved in this project. Mm -hmm. Uh, to send kids, I want to have an, uh, an extra opportunity to sing to come over. And in fact, even in the name, it's the North Shore Youth Choir, not worship choir, uh, church choir, uh, anything else like that, because mm -hmm. we want a place to engage those that are really immersed in the in the worst parts of the culture sometimes, mm -hmm. to be able to come and experience Christ through the culture of the choir. Yeah. Um, it's also important you know, that, that we have scripturally these worship leaders that we're teaching that we're training up that we're bringing up and the only way to do that is to get them involved in the ministry of the church which for us is our choirs and so for us being being in a, in a place where the youth maybe aren't going to come to our adult choirs to sing with the adults or even come to a structured uh, youth choir event being able to have something for the ones who really care about that and hone their skills. And then hopefully, as time progresses, build and build and build mm -hmm. to where maybe one day all of our churches can have our own mm -hmm. choir. Mm -hmm. And then this greater community choir that will help with that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think, I, I look at it like this. I, I'm from Baptist life, and uh, especially in Baptist life, there seems to be a lot of pushback um, in the contemporary culture, especially against choral music and, and the choirs, because they think that it doesn't it, it doesn't interact with culture very well. But I go to an ACDA meeting, and how many how many young people do you see yeah. there? They found something to plug into that they can connect with, that they can contribute to, that they feel like that they personally can make an impact. And so helping our choirs to have this same kind of vision, I think is important. Um, and so in that way, you know, even in my church, it's been a really positive impact. The congregation sings out more. The, the church is starting to appreciate artistic music so that whenever we, we do have a contemporary service, but I've seen over time that they complain less and less if I throw something different in there. Because they've had these experiences with uh, really good choral and, and quality choral music, mm -hmm. or instrumental music, or orchestral music, something like that to help them in their walk with Christ. Yeah, that's great. And I think when you hear some pushback, well, uh, one idea I had there was that the pushback is because it's what's really being said is it's because it's not easy. Yeah, it's hard. It is hard work. It is not for the lazy minister. Now, let me tell you, friends, there's a lot of them out there that don't know what it means to really work hard. I mean, having left the teaching world and going back and just observations, I'm mean, like, wow, 
I feel like I'm I'm not saying I'm the only one working hard, but I just feel like maybe at the level that I'm working hard because of where I just came from and what I had to do. And I'm like, let's get this thing going. And so I'm running around getting swift to kind of rear end a few people, you know, like, let's get after this. It's hard work, but it is so worth it when I think when you go back and see the dividends that it can yield, you know, and you and seeing where culture is and how it addresses that, how do you argue with that? When I was like, man, how do you how do you argue with these kind of benefits, you know? So the idea, if it's not friends, if we're foes, how do we make friends out of this and culture? How do you do this in your own place? There's a great article, and there's even a video out with this lady's name, Stacy Horn on YouTube. She talks about um, the really the biological benefits of singing. It's really really cool. And she's just a she's from up northeast somewhere. And she joined a community choir, and she ended up doing a TED talk on her experience and what it, how it kind of changed her life. And she's just an average person, uh, not a trained singer by any means. The article that she t wrote, with Ode to Joy, uh, join a choir, science shows it'll make you feel better. And she was having some real emotional, personal struggles, and how choir actually walked her through that. A few points, she talks about the neuro chemical rewards, uh, how it actually physically changes, and you know, actually in, in ancient history, they knew this. They talked about how the body chemistry would be even changed, and the different bile's black bile, yellow bile, like your chemistry would be even changed by the music that you would listen to, or music that you would even create. Uh, so this is not a new concept, but it's really good. Benefit, and the thing about this that she talks about is there are benefits to singing regardless of the quality of the person making the music. <laughs> that said, even if it's of the most mediocre quality, it yields immense benefits. The, uh, one of the scientists that were ref referenced in this article said this about it. Singing might be our most perfect drug, the ultimate mood regulator, lowering, lowering rates of anxiety, depression, and loneliness, while at the same time amplifying happiness and joy with no discernible unpleasant side effects. I like this last line. The nerds and the church people had it right. <laughs> he knew it, and science has confirmed what those people have known intuitively for decades. There's a handout inside your uh, packet, a one-sheet thing. How many of you know, have you heard of the name Michael Kemp before? Mm -hmm. Michael Kemp does great work. He's been very much um, featured with his work with the aging voice. He has a resource that I would really recommend you get for some maybe fresh ideas from vocal instruction, warm-ups, to just practical day-to-day -day stuff called the Choral Challenge. In that book, I've used it with some of my classes before. It's really, really helpful. Uh, in that, there's a, there's a little section where he talks about why bother with choirs. <laughs> and he lists what I've provided for you there. All these different reasons. We're not going to go through them one by one, but I just want you to have this. And he talks about how they benefit the singers. And there's some really great points there that he makes. Um, then there's a second part of it. And he talks about using this if you have to ever go defend your program to a pastor, to an administrative board, to parents, to whomever. If you're, in, if you're called into question, he just makes some great points that we know, some of these things you'll know. Uh, but the second part of it talks about how, the choir, how choirs can benefit church, school, or an organization. Think of it so like some sort of community group. Uh, so I wanted you to have that. Look at that on your own time. There's some really great points that he makes. Another article, uh, Ed Stetzer, used to be with Lifeway. He's now up at Wheaton College, I believe. Future of Music in the Church. Really insightful, very short, very quick read about some, some things that we should consider moving forward as it relates to um, whether preserving old, old, what he would say maybe is old ways of doing things and considering new ways. And it has some good comments about thinking about how it relates to choirs. Um, so my question to you is, are you with this thought, are you prone to be reactive or proactive? And I can think of people in churches that have had reactive responses as opposed to proactive responses. Maybe you have a pastor like that or a staff members that 
when a challenge arises, they're going to be one of these two ways. Uh, here are some thoughts I want to give to you in being proactive. How do we be proactive in trying to make friends between having choir programs, especially student choir programs, okay, in your churches? When you do anything with this group, because you will have one, I believe it, I speak it in faith, you're going to have a youth choir, claim it. Always be prepared, this is understood, but always be engaging in your presentation. Uh, I love this quote here, this is really long, but it's really good. Uh, Joseph Farmerfeld, oh, longtime teacher at Westminster Choir College, here we go. In musical performances, he talks about this disconnection between the audience and people, uh, and, and the choir. The disconnection I allude to above has manifested itself in performances in which technical virtuosity becomes the only goals, and the music students, both theoretical and historical, very often stop uh, music. Uh, something happened there. Stop short of musical considerations, meaning which I believe can only be ascertained by allowing oneself to intuitively reflect upon the human spiritual impulse of each musical gesture allows a song to happen because the synthesis of cognition, intuition, craft and content, spirit and flesh, surface and substance are in play. The full form of a musical work of art is allowed to communicate, that's the word, not to dazzle, not to impress, but to communicate. Then the listener's lives can be touched at the deepest level and be forever changed. Always be prepared and always be engaging. How are you going to be communicating with your groups when they sing in worship? Communicating with your people. Some principles that I want to provide for you that I think of some questions you should ask as you're getting your thing, uh, groups prepared. What distractions or perhaps cultural hurdles can you think about removing? This can be so contextually specific. Okay? So these are just broad questions that I think can apply in different situations. To make your message clearer, hurdles make that message blurry sometimes. How can we enhance our presentation to make the message more convincing? What creative aspects can you maybe bring? I want to say this about creativity. It's not something you do. It's the way you do something. Okay? Not something you do, it's the way you do something. Number three, how can we streamline our presentation to make the experience more impactful? Sometimes our presentations, if we're singing, things are bumpy. If we're doing a concert or even the way of worship kind of flows sometimes, it's bumpy and it loses impact. The last one, how can we involve and connect with listeners? If we can figure out, this is one thing I talk with my students a lot, this broad chasm, this great divide, as I call it, between the platform and the listener. That could be in a church, that could be in a school, that could be in a community event. The mark of great work on the platform is how they close that divide to where it almost goes away. How do you bridge that divide? How do you, how do you decrease that chasm between what's happening on the platform and who's listening to it? When you figure that out in your context, things are gonna start happening things are going to start making a difference, okay? And what we want to figure out is how to, when we close that, we can make, instead of this us and them, it's we. And that's really, really important. Number two, always arm your people with a philosophy of choir-led worship. What are some points of that? Here's a few things I'm going to throw out for you. Scripture <laughs> really gives us a lot of information, a lot of context for choir-led worship. It's corporate in nature. This is good. Utilize as many gifts as possible in worship. Friends, going back to this, the idea of this, it has to be more than we've just always had a choir and we want to have it because people like to sing. That's very self-serving. It's a good reason, but again, it's more inward-focused and it's self-serving. Yes, it's a place for people to use their gifts, but it's so much more than that. Okay? It's an organized ministry that can function and work outside of the church. Yes, a lot of opportunities there. This tension between the for us choir versus the for them choir. The people who will listen, who will hear, okay, or the people we're going to serve. Put that in there. 
a choir, I've always thought, is a microcosm of the local church. That's one of the most amazing things about it. How is that? Every function of the church can, doesn't always, but can exist inside a choir, grow maturity, right? This is the minister of education. Tell missions, right? <laughs> Belong, membership, right? Serve, ministry, being the hands and feet, acts of service, and then of course worship. A choir can do all of those things. Isn't that so cool? I love that. So that, and then that's what makes things, one thing that makes the church choir, student or not, so uh, just <clears throat> have such an impact. Third thing, being proactive. Don't give up territory you already have. But you may have to make compromises. Whatever that means in your situation, if it's finding a rehearsal time, it's a rehearsal space, it's calendar issues. Try not to lose territory, but always be ready to make compromises. Number four, build a diverse network of support. You cannot do this alone. It's going to take one person at a time in and outside of the church, whether it's staff members, parents, getting support, other people in your city that maybe have youth choirs or that want to start a youth choir, other ministers of music, other youth choir directors, other school choir directors, okay? Getting to know those folks and share your common goals. You're working with the same students, especially if you're in a church and a school in a, a school neighborhood. Those are the same kids if they're involved in the choir over there, right? So getting collaboration together is really important. I like this idea. I heard one time of a prayer chant idea. You know, and I don't want to just throw prayer out, you know, kind of willy nilly like it's some sort of magic pill. But what if you found seven people, seven, that you felt kind of could be that network of people that support you, your ministry, could be parents, staff, whatever, and then you ask them to find seven people, each of them, and pray for the work of your choir ministry. Your ministry in general, but specifically if you're wanting to start or grow a student choir, suddenly you've got 49 people praying for that possibility, for that growth, for that impact to come. Uh, some practical adjustments you can make. This is a whole bunch of stuff I just even threw down there for you so you didn't have to write them all down. Make sure you're being strategic when you use your choir. Sometimes that may, may mean you sing less, but more strategic in your presentations, whether it's in worship or in the community. Consider their use. Are they just presenting, or is it more congregational leading in its use? Think of non-traditional ways to use the choir. The lady I mentioned earlier said she sang from the pews. How interesting is that? Maybe the choir has a little bit more involvement with a prayer ministry in the church. They're connected with praying for the requests that maybe come to the church that the church knows about. You empower the choir to be more than just a singing arm, but a ministry arm, right? Perhaps choir members come out and pray in service, or they read scripture. The choir members do more than just sing in a service, and your student choir can do more than just sing in a service but do multiple things. Have them be worship leaders, lead the whole thing, or most of it. How can you enhance with media what you're doing or other creative elements? Consider an intergenerational choir. I have a friend who calls it All In Sundays. It's not just as youth, but it's children, youth, adults, senior adults. And they do familiar music, and they just, even that Sunday morning, they say, hey, all, it's an All In Sunday. If you're out there and you want to sing up here in the choir, and it's, there's no presentational piece, there's no anthem but they just are all together singing from the platform leading worship. Very powerful. This to me is huge right here, this idea of a service-based choir. If you're just singing unto yourselves in your congregation, I just don't think that is speaking into culture anymore. I think you need to have purpose. You need to have some perhaps care groups within the choir, that in-reach piece. Okay, so there's service in self into itself. But this what I call sing and serve projects. You go out, you sing, and you serve. That outreach piece is huge. This is another minute here. Culturally, with all the challenges, it takes time, but what rehearsal aids are you providing? Whether it's recordings, digital sheet music, 
don't just burn a CD, but figure out a way to put this online where there's Dropbox and students can download things to their phone and they can listen to that music. CDs are fine, but very few computers even have a CD player anymore. But if you can use Dropbox or Google Drive or some sort of online sharing system and then put all that music out, put sheet music, scan it in, and the recordings, easy access, easy prep, really helps. Using technology to stay in touch. Do you use Remind01, Room 101, or do you use GroupMe to stay in touch, putting all those cell phone numbers in and send a quick message, hey choir, thank you for you, praying for you this week. Send out a scripture verse, send out a video. Wow, I just heard this song. Man, it really ministered to me, but I hope you have a great day. I hope it ministers to you. Um, using social media to promote and stay connected. I think very, very uh, important. Leverage those tools. They are often distractions, you can use them to keep your folks connected. One last thing I want to say. I heard Adrian Rogers say this. I should have quoted him or cited him. Do not fight for victory. Fight from victory. It's a very different mindset, very different position. Okay? Is you're fighting to keep your choir or fighting to start one or preserve or generate something new. Fight from victory. I want it, and I expanded to say this. Do not fight to save choirs. Fight to serve people. That is a totally different mindset. Fight to serve people. That can be the people in the choirs or the people that are going to be receiving what your choir has to offer. Scripture gives us two encouragements here. Romans 12. For those of you, if you think you have foes in this area. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Those foes you think you have. Your culture foe, whatever it may be. But leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. This is interesting what I found. But to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Where did this come from? <coughs> He's quoting Proverbs. And what is interesting about this verse? Before he gets there, look! Whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day and like vinegar on soda. If your enemy is hungry, give him something, uh, give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him something water to drink, for you will eat burning coals on his head. How interesting is that? That was really amazing to me. <laughs> Are there any comments, questions, really quickly? Y'all have been wonderful. Did you get all your blanks filled in? Is yeah. this helpful? A blank fill. A blank fill. I tried. Yes. Listen, I hope I see you again. I hope I didn't give you too much. Are you okay? Are you overwhelmed? Mm -hmm. Are you encouraged in some way? Mm -hmm.